Up next in the broadcast, President Bach works to quickly reshuffle her cabinet with the replacement of the resigning prime minister in top focus. South Korean Cardinal Andrew Yumsu Jung becomes the first Korean Roman Catholic leader to visit North Korea. The move may pave the way for Pope Francis this summer. After declaring martial law, Thailand's military calls pro and anti-government protesters to a meeting to resolve the months-long series of violent demonstrations. Primetime News begins now. Hello and welcome to Primetime News. I'm Sean Lim. Hello everybody. I am Kang Tae-ri. Thanks for joining us. President Park Geun-hye returned home earlier today from her trip to the UAE over a pivotal nuclear deal, but now it's back to reshuffling her key staffers. The top office says she has no official schedule for the next couple of days, but it's likely she'll use the time to pick a new prime minister to kick off a major cabinet shakeup. Our Hwang Ji-hye reports. When President Park apologized this week for the government's poor response to the ferry disaster, she chose not to mention her plans to shake up the cabinet. But as she told the families of the victims late last week, follow-up measures to the accident, including a reshuffle, are expected to speed up in the coming days. <laughs> Pundits are carefully looking at who will be the president's candidate for prime minister with the current prime minister, Chung Ung won set to resign to take responsibility for the government's lax response to the ferry disaster. They say the appointment of a new prime minister will mark the starting point of the cabinet shakeup. Speculation is rife that the nomination of a new prime minister could come as early as this week as it's already been almost a month since Tung offered to step down. Those held most responsible for the poor handling of the disaster, the ministers of oceans and fisheries, public administration and education are most likely to face the chop, but there are growing calls for a clean sweep. Ruling and opposition party lawmakers are demanding the entire cabinet as well as senior officials at the presidential office step down. Pundits say President Park's new government lineup will affect how the public evaluates the sincerity of her apology and will play a key role in whether she wins back public sentiment. Hwang Ji, Arirang News. And as for the latest on the investigation into the ferry disaster and those believed responsible, with an arrest warrant in hand, authorities have finally entered the religious compound of the owner of the ferry operator, Yu byung -an, but uh, not much success so far in finding him. Park ji tells us more. Prosecutors and police finally made their way into the religious compound in Ansan, Gyeonggi-do province at about noon on Wednesday to execute an arrest warrant for Yu byung -an, the practical owner of the sewol -ho ferry operator. Hundreds of members of Yu's religious cult who have been surrounding the estate for the past few days as human shields allowed only investigating prosecutors in. Investigators searching for the 73-year-old Yu inside the 230,000 square meter compound have seen no sign of him, and they suspect that he may be hiding elsewhere, like at the home of one of his believers. So they began zeroing in on the homes of Yu's believers and are conducting undercover operations to find him. Prosecutors are also trying to find evidence inside the compound in relation to criminal charges against the Yu family as they've been granted a search and seizure warrant. Wednesday's operation came after Yu had ignored previous orders by prosecutors to show up for questioning over embezzlement, tax evasion and malpractice charges. The authorities believe there may be some causal link there with the ferry operators, lack of investment in safety drills and personnel management. Prosecutors are also trying to bring in Yu Daegun, the eldest son of Yu byung -an, on charges of tax evasion and embezzlement of funds from company affiliates owned by the Yu family. 
He was last seen at Incheon International Airport buying a one-way ticket to France three days after the ferry accident happened last month. However, as he was already banned from travel by the authorities, he didn't board a plane. Since then, his whereabouts have been unknown. Regarding youth, other children staying in foreign countries who haven't responded to prosecutors' orders for questioning, the authorities are trying to get them extradited through cooperation with other countries. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Just two weeks to go until Koreans cast their ballots for the local elections, and recent polls suggest voters living in key regions, at least, are warming to the main opposition party. Ji Myung Gil reports on what's behind this trend. The effect of the government's poor handling of this Heldo Ferry disaster is being reflected in recent polling, which shows that the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy is gaining support in Seoul, Incheon, and Gyeonggi-do province. According to a poll conducted this week by TNS Korea of more than 14,000 likely voters, the ruling Senate Party's candidate for Seoul Mayor, Jung Mong Jun, is more than 15 points behind incumbent Mayor Park Won Soon, who was at 51 percent support. It's a similar story in the city of Incheon, where the ruling party mayoral candidate Yoo jong Bok is trailing incumbent Song Young gil of the opposition party by more than 10 percentage points. The race for governor of Gyeonggi-do province is much tighter. Just 0.9 percentage points separates Henry candidate Nam Kyung pil and opposition candidate Kim Jin-pyo in the TNS Korea polling. All three local races are considered significant on the national stage, as the three areas boast about half of Korea's total population. Earning victories in these races can give a party a full head of steam heading into future legislative and presidential elections. In other important local races, such as in the conservative stronghold city of Busan and in the liberal stronghold city of Gwangju, the polling fell more along party lines. According to a survey conducted by the National Election Commission last week, 55.8 percent of respondents said they would vote on election day, up one percentage point from the 2010 local elections. Campaigning is set to begin on Thursday, and public safety has emerged as the hot button issue in light of April's ferry disaster. Kim young Arirang News. The Korean government says it's spending an extra 7.6 billion U.S. dollars by the end of next month to perk up domestic demand, which has taken a hit from the Seoul Ho ferry tragedy. This came during a policy meeting with the ruling Senate Party on Wednesday, where Finance Minister Hyun Oseok said the move is part of government efforts to make sure the ferry disaster does not derail economic recovery. The government is also considering tax breaks and other financial support for the tourism, transportation and lodging industries hurt badly by the disaster. Your gateway to the day's biggest stories in Korea and around the world. Breaking news, the hottest interviews and a whole lot more. Join Arirang Sean Lim and Kang Chedi from the heart of Seoul begins now. Primetime News, weeknights, live at 10 on Arirang TV. South Korean Cardinal Andrew Yeom Soo Jung made history on Wednesday, becoming the very first Korean Roman Catholic leader to cross the inter-Korean border into North Korea. And with the Pope Francis scheduled to come to Seoul in August, some expect he will become the very first pope to visit North Korea. Hwang Song-hee reports. Cardinal Andrew Yeom Soo Jung became the first Korean Roman Catholic leader to ever cross the inter-Korean border on Wednesday. The trip comes amid escalating tensions on the peninsula, but after touring the factory zone and meeting with South Korean Catholics there, Cardinal Yeom said he saw hope for the two Koreas. By visiting the Kaesong Industrial Complex, where the South and the North must live together, I saw hope that the two Koreas can overcome their pain and sadness. If goodwill people try with an honest heart, I think we can secure peace on the peninsula. While there were questions on whether the trip was political, the Cardinal's delegation said they had no contact with North Korean officials. Cardinal Yam, who had been vocal about his desire to hold mass at the Kaesong complex, instead prayed with South Korean Catholics for the two Koreas. 
He had planned to hold mass at the Joint Industrial Park last December, but it was scrapped at the last minute following the execution of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's uncle, Chang sung tae The cardinal's trip comes three months before Pope Francis is scheduled to arrive in South Korea for a visit, fueling speculation that the Holy Father could also make a stop in the north. Pope Francis, who has shown a great deal of interest in peace and reconciliation between the two Koreas, is expected to deliver a message for the entire peninsula when he visits Seoul in August. However, the Korean Catholic Church said the cardinal's visit was arranged upon request by a group of South Korean Catholics last year and that the pope has no plans to visit North Korea. For now, the attention is on whether Cardinal Yum's rare trip will contribute in thawing inter-Korean relations. Hwang sang Arirang News, Paju. Russian President Vladimir Putin is enjoying a warm welcome from his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping and as the two pledged to forge closer ties, they sealed a multi-billion dollar business deal. Shin Se-min has the latest on the Russia-China alliance. President Xi and Putin finally came to an agreement and signed off on a huge gas deal worth 400 billion U.S. dollars on Wednesday. A 30-year contract between the Russian state-controlled fuel supplier and Chinese National Petroleum Corporation is seen as an indicator that Moscow has finally found a new buyer for its gas outside of Europe. The business deal was first discussed during the first round of summit talks on Tuesday, but was left unsigned as both sides couldn't agree on a price at which Russia would supply gas. The price tag on the Russian gas is still not disclosed, but the deal is seen as a move by Moscow to shift the country's interests eastward amid sanctions from the international community for its annexation of Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula. During a meeting in Shanghai on Tuesday, President Xi and Putin agreed to strengthen their economic and military ties. They also held in-depth talk about North Korea's nuclear and missile programs. Praising the tightening military ties between the two sides, President Putin said he was convinced Moscow and Beijing could forge a strong strategic partnership and that bilateral military cooperation was developing very well. Putin's visit to China coincided with the beginning of the two countries' joint naval exercises, Joint Sea 2014. The drills have raised red flags in Seoul as they overlap with South Korea's expanded air defense identification zone. Neither Moscow nor Beijing notified the South Korean government prior to its announcement. It's the first time an international military exercise has taken place within Korean waters since the expansion of the air defense zone last December. In regards to the security situation on the Korean Peninsula, both sides said they were concerned about North Korea's nuclear program and the simmering political and military tensions between the two Koreas. China and Russia stressed the long-stalled six-party talks on North Korea's denuclearization are the only effective way of reaching a deal everyone is happy with. They called on all parties to do more to secure peace and stability in the region. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. It's day two of martial law in Thailand. In an effort to find a peaceful solution to the political crisis, Thailand's army chief summoned the leaders of rival political groups and parties for a dialogue. And in the meantime, the country's interim government has called for fresh general elections on August 3rd. This comes after the election commission last week said it was logistically impossible to hold elections by the previously set July deadline. Thailand's caretaker prime minister said he will meet with the electoral body to finalize a date as early as next week. And for more on this, Paul Qualia joins us from Thailand via Skype. Paul is the director at the Bangkok-based risk assessment firm PQA Associates. Thank you so much for joining us. What are we expecting out of this meeting that the Thai military called between uh, protesters? Well, the meeting already got off to a rocky start. Uh, General Prayut, the army chief who called the meeting, uh, ordered, quote unquote, the civilian government's acting prime minister to appear. And he, of course, uh, resisted that order, saying, look, the army's supposed to be working for the civilian government, not the other way around. Um, to answer your question, the, the point of the meeting is to draw the stakeholders into a private setting as opposed to a public setting. 
and try and work out some negotiated settlement to the political dispute. So the military apparently seemed to have called this meeting because they thought things were getting out of hand. What's the mood like on the streets? Uh, South Korea has issued a travel advisory uh, to ensure the safety of its citizens. How is this affecting ordinary ties and visitors? Hardly noticeable. Uh, I mean, yesterday, when martial law was declared, of course, it was a surprise. Um, and there were significant troop deployments in many areas of the city, not only in Bangkok, but other areas of the country. As martial law developed during the day, and as it appeared that protesters were going to behave themselves, the military began to draw down their deployments. And that's part of a very strong effort on their part to appear neutral. We're not having a coup, is their message. Don't worry. This isn't a big deal. We just want to make sure that the ties are safe and foreign visitors can come without trouble. At your firm, uh, it's a security risk assessment agency. What's the internal assessment of the situation there, uh, given the announcement of uh, martial law yesterday? And what's the uh, variable uh, to be watched most closely at this point? I think what has to be most closely watched are the moves of the military. Uh, General Prayut and the army, uh, as, the, as the basic power brokers in Thailand, have decisively grabbed authority in the country. And, and in one sense, this is a good thing. Um, this government that we have now has been weak for several months. They've been unable to really effectively govern the country. So on the streets of Bangkok, there's a palpable sense of relief. Someone's finally in control. We don't have protesters uh, marauding all over the city, causing a lot of chaos. The problem, of course, is now the military has to once the once peace and order have been restored, they now have to move into the political arena to try and work out a solution. And the military is less skilled at being a political mediator. So was martial law the only way to bring about a peace at this point? Yes, uh, martial law is the only way for the military to bring out uh, to bring a solution at this point. They looked at it as a security problem, not a political problem initially. They saw, okay, we have demonstrations scheduled for later this week. They're going to be big. Strikes were supposedly to take place to cut utilities to some government buildings. It looked like potential chaos looming. So the government, the military in particular, acted preemptively to try and stop this. The acting uh, prime minister and his office didn't exactly uh, come off strong on the first day of martial law. Could this be the first step in a coup? Could be. That's why I said earlier, it depends where we're going with all of this. Um, the red shirt protesters, of course, who are uh, against any sort of military action, are quite suspicious of the army. Uh, and they believe there is a grand conspiracy to stage a coup and eventually get an appointed government and derail elections. I'm not so sure that's true. I think the, the military is genuine in its efforts uh, to try and simply restore order to begin with and to see if they can work a political solution out. My concern is that once they meet resistance and they are unable to get to a negotiated settlement, that they will in turn impose that political solution. All right, Mr. Qualia, thank you so much for your insight and time for tonight. Welcome. More violence in Nigeria, this time twin bomb attacks in a central city that have uh, killed uh, more than 100 people. With more on that story, we turn now to Paul Yee standing by at the News Center. Paul, do we know who's behind these attacks? Although no one has claimed responsibility, the Islamist militant group Boko Haram yet again is being blamed for the blast. The two car bombs exploded in Nigeria's central city of Jos on Tuesday, killing at least 118 local civilians. One route through the center of a busy market, another later outside a nearby hospital killing some rescue workers. The death toll could rise further as more bodies are recovered from the smoldering debris. Boko Haram has also been accused of killing 17 people in a separate attack in northeastern Nigeria, near a village where hundreds of schoolgirls were abducted last month. President Goodluck Jonathan has issued a statement expressing sympathy for the victims, reassuring the public that the government remains committed to winning the war against terror. More than 1,000 people are believed to have been killed by Boko Haram this past year. Turning now to Brazil, another wave of protests has hit Sao Paulo with less than a month before the country hosts the World Cup. Two main protest groups marched through the Brazil's largest city on Wednesday, including the city's bus union that is striking over higher wages. 
Public transportation was paralyzed as bus employees, drivers and conductors walked out on the job. Brazil's landless workers' movement has also joined the growing demonstrations. About 2,000 homeless protesters stormed the office of a construction company which owns land occupied by the movement in recent weeks. Public outrage erupted after the final bill of hosting the World Cup came to an estimated 60 billion U.S. dollars. Many Brazilians have accused the government of misplaced priorities while public services remain underfunded and some 11 million people living in slum-like conditions in Sao Paulo alone. Nonetheless, the World Cup opening match is set to kick off on June 12th. And finally, moving on to China, where the government has issued a ban on Microsoft's latest computer operating system. Beijing said the ban on installing Windows 8 on all Chinese government computers was part of a notice regarding energy-saving products. Xinhua News Agency said it was also to ensure computer safety, as the U.S. tech company continues to struggle with sales in the communist country. Well, there, there are two elements here. One is technical, uh, whatever the specific reasons uh, that the Chinese has, and one is political. And when you're dealing with China and large multinational organizations like Microsoft, there's always a political angle. Meanwhile, Microsoft has doubled down on tablet PCs as it attempts to shift its business towards consumer devices and services. The faster and thinner Surface Pro 3 was availed at an event in New York on Tuesday, which the company hopes will eventually replace Main Street laptops. That wraps up a look at international stories making headlines around the world. I'll see you back here tomorrow night. Hello and welcome to Primetime Sports. I'm Stephen Che. Park Ji-sung may have retired from pro football, but has a few more matches left in the tank. He welcomed his teammates from PSV Eindhoven, who are here for their tour of Korea. And part of that tour will have them play two goodwill-friendly matches against Suwon Samsung on Thursday and Gyeongnam FC on Saturday. Now Park will suit up with PSV for the matches, playing at least 45 minutes in both. And speaking about it, the 33-year-old said he wants to play well in front of the fans for the last time. And moving on to archery, South Korea has returned to its dominating position atop the world rankings with the recurve bow. Retaking the number one spot in the mixed team rankings after winning the event at the latest World Cup stage, South Korea is now first in all five of the recurve categories. They include the men's, women's and mixed teams, as well as the men's and women's individual rankings. Now it's baseball. The Korea Baseball Organization may expand their video replay system amid a rise in bad calls this year by umpires. KBO Secretary General Yang Hae-yong said the league will discuss expanding the scope of reviewable plays at a meeting early next month. A sharp backlash from fans has forced them to visit the issue earlier than expected. And leaving all of that there, let's get to Wednesday's top KBO matchups. First, it's the SK Wyverns taking on the NC Dinos in Mazan. Now it's the first inning. SK's Luke Scott hits a sack fly. Then Park Jung-won, he drives in two. It's 4-0 SK. Now we go on to the next inning. Scott helps them again for two runs before NC finally brings one home. It's 6-1 SK, but SK's not done. Park Jung-won, he belts a solo shot followed by Scott's homer in the sixth, and SK goes on to win this one easily 10-2. Meanwhile, here in Seoul, it's the Hanwha Eagles versus the next in heroes, Hanwha's Kim kyung -un. He singles one home in the first inning, and they're up 2-0 in the bottom fourth when Nexon's Itaekun, he answers with a shot to center field. Now fifth inning, Hanwha scores one in the top, but in the bottom, Itaekun again, he hits a sack fly for the second Nexon run. Hanwha extends their lead in the sixth as Felix Pie comes home, and it's all tied up in the seventh, but Hanwha's Jeongbommo, excuse me, and Kim Taegyun homer late in the game, and Hanwha and Nexon are still playing in this one. It's 9-4 at the top of the ninth. And looking at the other scores, LG beats Kia 4-0. Meanwhile, Samsung edges out Lotte 7-5. That's all I have for now. This has been Stephen Che. I'll see you back here later for more from the world of sports.
Today is Homan, one of the seasonal indicators that marks the beginning of summer, and we certainly felt it. Yes, we did. It was really hot over here in Seoul, and Kim Bogyang is standing by for us at the Weather Center for more. Bogyang. Good evening, guys. Although today is Homan, the weather seems to be ahead of schedule. Earlier today, daytime highs soared to 27 degrees here in Seoul and 31 in Daegu. It looks like this unseasonably hot weather will continue for for a while, but there will be a brief cooldown after Sunday's nationwide showers. At the moment, we are seeing relatively clear skies due to a high pressure trough that is moving from the east to the west near Shanghai. Clouds along with strong winds are moving in over eastern coastal regions. This will cause daytime highs there to drop to about 20 degrees, which is a little lower than the seasonal average. Other than that, tomorrow is shaping up to be another hot day elsewhere in the country. As for Thursday's readings, Seoul hits 28 degrees while Daegu and Gwangju jump to the low 30s. Moving on to other places, Daeju remains relatively cool at 24 degrees, Tokdo and Mount Kumgang reach 15 and 22. And that's all the updates for now, but I'll be back with more after midnight. And that does it for this edition of Primetime News. Thanks for watching and good night.